Today, I'm reviewing this computer right here, the Asus VivaBook F510UA, and telling you why it is or close to the best budget laptop, especially for photo and video. Let's get right into it. Hello, I'm Noah from Anything Cameras, the channel that focuses on helping you improve your filming and photography. And like I said, we're reviewing this computer, the Asus VivaBook F510UA. I know, it's a mouthful. They should really give these computers better names. Maybe that's why Apple sells so many laptops even though they suck. Anyway, moving past my Apple version, which I know I will get hate for in the comments, this computer is pretty great. This is a 15 inch laptop. It has an 8th gen Intel quad core i5 at 1.6 gigahertz, boosted to 3.4 gigahertz with a six megabyte cache. It has eight gigs of DDR4 RAM, a terabyte HDD, no SSD, but I'll talk about that later. Fast Wi-Fi cards with speeds up to 860 megabytes per second. Bluetooth, Intel UHD Graphics 620, a 1080p screen, good battery life, one USB 3.0 slot, two USB 2.0 slot, an HDMI port, a USB-C port, an SD card slot, and best of all, amazing upgradability. And all of this comes in at only $509 USD on Amazon at the time of recording this video. Like I mentioned, it's $509 on Amazon. Everywhere else, it's $600, but even $600 is a good price for this laptop. Also, before I really begin this review, I would like to say that, that I am not sponsored by Asus. I've never even talked with them. They're not giving me money. They're not giving me this computer. I bought this computer with my own money, and it's all my own opinion. With that out of the way, let's get into the review, starting with build quality. This computer is made of a hard plastic and is very thin, making it lightweight and durable but not feeling cheap. Overall, the build quality is good, but I do wish that they sacrificed some weight and price for metal instead of hard plastic, or at least a metal shell around hard plastic. That would have been very nice to see. The screen is a very nice screen. It's not particularly high resolution, but the colors are good and the sharpness is excellent and I have no complaints overall. If you really need a 4K screen, then don't let this 1080p screen throw you off from buying this computer because you can always buy an external monitor that has 4K, but really you're not gonna see that much of a difference in a screen of this size. The connectivity of this computer is one thing that makes it great for photo and video. As I mentioned, it has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and an SD card slot as well as a large variety of connection ports. The ports are nice and strong and don't feel like they'll break easily at all, which has been the case with some laptops that I've owned. I do wish it had an ethernet port and I get that they can't really fit that in laptop of this thinness, but it really would have been nice to see because even though it has a fast Wi-Fi card and that makes up for the lack of an ethernet port to an extent, it's really about output speed from the modem rather than input speed into the computer that gives Ethernet an advantage. That and it's a stronger connection, more reliable. The battery life is pretty good. I've not done any full on tests, but I've gone about six hours of light use, meaning that the computer was on and most of that time I was working. The screen brightness was lowered and I only had one or two applications open. I give you all these details because it advertises eight hours of battery life However, I've seen reviews that says it has terrible battery life. Overall, you should be fine with this battery, and for a laptop this small and compact, I think that they did a very good job with the battery life. The CPU is very good, especially for this price. It's the best CPU you can get for under $600, and the fact that it's quad-core with such a high boosted speed makes it great for any type of use. It has a decent base speed at 1.6 gigahertz, but the boosted speed of 3.4 gigahertz is really where the advantage is, as well as the six megabyte cache. Overall, this CPU should work for you for photo or video. Maybe it won't be good for 4K 60p video, especially if it's a high bit rate or 422 or 10 bit or something like that. But I think that overall for some light, moderate, or moderate video use, then you should be fine. I'll tell you my experience editing photos and videos on this soon, right after I get past all the specifications. Now, before my two favorite features, let me get some complaints in. First off, the internal graphics on this thing are very poor. 
They're just Intel 620 UHD graphics with 4GB GPU memory. And while graphics of this caliber are expected, I do wish, and I know I say this a lot, they'd sacrificed a little bit of price for graphics of just a little bit higher caliber. If you really need a good graphics card, then I'd recommend something like the Acer Spire E15, which is a gaming laptop and has an actual graphics card. And it also comes in at a similar price range. However, for that graphics card, you're sacrificing a lot of other features that I like on the Asus better. I'm honestly having a hard time coming up with negative things about this computer. Besides something I need to say for later, one of my complaints would be that it doesn't have an SSD unless you spend $100 for a 128 gigabyte one. However, that brings me to my favorite feature, which is the upgradability. It comes with eight gigabytes of DDR4 RAM, but it has two slots, each up to 16 gigabytes each, meaning you can get 32 gigabytes out of this laptop, which is super awesome. And really, unless you're doing heavy professional work, 32 gigabytes is plenty. I have 16 gigabytes in it, and I often have several applications and tabs open, and I'm fine. And eight should serve your purpose if you're minimalistic about how many tabs you have open. However, I would recommend at least 12 if you're doing heavy video or photo work. But now let me talk about the SSD, or rather lack thereof. As we all know, SSDs make computers way faster because they don't have to spin like a hard drive does in order to access information, meaning it comes out to be much quicker. But like I mentioned, this computer does not have one unless you spend an extra $100 for a 128 gigabyte SSD. However, if you spend $50 for a 256 gigabyte SATA M2 SSD, this computer has a port for one in the motherboard. So you can open up the computer, pop in the SSD, clone the hard drive over, and then you have your operating system and all your applications on the SSD making it run two times faster and have one terabyte of file space on your hard drive. And with an SSD in the computer, you should have no problem with the internal graphics of this computer since they are poor. But now we're to my biggest complaint, which is the motherboard of this computer. Though it has all of these connection ports, it's a very limited motherboard. Let me explain why. So a couple months after buying this computer, I bought another stick of 8GB DDR4 dual rank CL17 RAM, which is 100% compatible with this computer. And I installed it like normal, which I've done several times, but I kept getting blue screens of death. So I updated my drivers, I did restarts, shutdowns, hard resets. I tried everything I could, but it kept giving me the blue screen of death, which all Windows users despise. So then I removed the old stick from my computer and tested it with just the new stick, which worked fine. So then I download CPU-Z to see what the clock speeds of each of the sticks were. Because if you have different clock speeds of your RAM sticks, they can desync and that will cause problems. So CPU-Z told me that the new stick was running 10, 10, 10, 28 clock speeds with a refresh rate of 420. Now the refresh rate was correct, but the clock speeds of 10, 10, 28, or rather 10, 10, 10, 28, were incorrect since this is a CL17 stick. That means that it should have run at 17, 17, 17, 39 clock speeds. So then I tested it with my other stick and it said that it was running 10, 10, 10, 28, 234 refresh rate. Now, the refresh rate was not the problem. The problem was somehow with both of the sticks running at CL10 speeds which I'm very confused about because the old stick should have also been running CL17 speeds from my understanding. It does not say CL17 on it, but based on the specifications, that's what it should have been running. So like I said, with one, only one stick in, it worked fine, no matter which stick it was. So I tried going into BIOS to enable XMP files so that the CL17 stick would run at its proper speeds, which would hopefully have fixed the problem or at least made the new stick faster. However, when I went to BIOS, the only options were nothing RAM. 
they were really limited options. There were no RAM options, no XMP options, which come under RAM options, but still. This is why the motherboard is terrible, because it has weird support for RAM, which I did end up fixing, don't worry, and it doesn't even have many BIOS options. So I almost decided to sell my old stick of RAM and buy a new one, losing a couple dollars, but having two sticks of the same speeds that would work together. But then, just in case, I decide to switch the sticks in their slots, which shouldn't have caused any difference, but for some reason, it worked. And this leads me to believe that one slot is different than the other, or it's just a fluke, but that is a problem if the both slots aren't the same. So those are the limitations of the motherboard, at least regarding RAM. Now, even though I had problems installing RAM in this computer, you should have no problem whatsoever installing an SSD. Like I said, you just pop the SATA M2 SSD in the slot, make sure it's not MVME, you clone the hard drive over to the SSD, make sure it's booting up from the SSD, and boom, you have your SSD and your file space on the hard drive. And hopefully we'll be coming out with a tutorial soon on how to do this, so you won't have to worry about doing anything wrong. Okay, so all these specs and things are great, but how does it hold up in a real life scenario? Well, I can say pretty well. When I have Lightroom, Photoshop, and several gr Google Chrome tabs open, I can edit photos pretty smoothly, and the only, only limiting factor is the RAM, but that was before I upgraded it. So you can always just close something like Google or upgrade the RAM and you'll be fine. The CPU holds up pretty well, though I will see it pushed to 100% when doing a hard task like a heavy spot removal. But as long as you pace yourself when doing something heavy on the CPU like that, you should be fine. And adjusting normal sliders and cropping and stuff like that will be no problem at all. The GPU... I don't ever see you go above 10% when editing photos, so you don't need to worry about that. Now in terms of editing video, I edit 1080 60p video very, very frequently, and I don't have a lot of problem. The CPU holds up pretty well, and like with photo editing, only reaches 100% when doing a task very strenuous, which wouldn't just be scrubbing through the timeline and cutting and moving clips. That requires more GPU, and I will see that pushed high if I have too much footage loaded into the editor and or timeline. You should be able to get good results even with 4K 60p footage if you're careful about your pacing so you don't do go too quickly, and especially if you upgrade your RAM and your SSD, you should, ha you should not have any problem. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, comment with any video recommendations or any questions, and I will see you next time.